Amen, amen. Um, so today we are in the Messy Matrimony series, and today we're talking about love. We're talking about romantic love. We're even talking about sexual love. And I'm going to make you blush just a little bit today. I might even make you blush a lot, depending on what you're used to talking about in church. But we're talking about love, and we're talking about, I'm going to run the ending for you. We're talking about the fact that we can fall out of love. And how do we fall back in love? And by the end, I've titled the message today, How to Fall Back in Love Again. Because many of us know what it is to fall out and to see love fade. But no one ever taught us how to rebuild love, even how to resurrect love. So we're going to look at that. I'm going to start, start you off with a story. Um, I was in high school, and I was a senior in high school, and I had this friend, and it was a Christian friend. And I remember going over to his house one day, and we were in his living room with his family, and this was a super healthy family. Have you ever gone and visited somebody, and you can just tell the way that they interact, how healthy they are? You know what I mean? It's just like they, they could be honest. They, they could pal around. They could, they could laugh. And they were talking, and the, the mom and dad in the room were talking about the fact that they were about to go on a trip, and it was going to be a long weekend, and it was just the two of them that were going, and they were making it very clear to their teenage kids what they were going to do on that long weekend. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't crude, but it was clear. And they were making it so clear and they were, you could tell they were really enjoying, you know, um, uh, pressing on their, their, their teens and stuff. And the teens were like losing their minds over it. Mom and dad, stop. Don't make us think about that. And it was so fun. And it was such a surprising conversation to watch unfold, but also to see this, these healthy people, this healthy mom and dad who they'd been married for a long time. And they're still talking about flutters in the stomach, okay? They're still talking about having fun. And sometimes in church, right? Like we get this idea of like what love is and like the pastors and the priests sometimes tell us, well, well love is when you really grow up and you get very serious and you get very self-sacrificing. And, and that's good. But isn't there more? And sometimes we think, well, well, if I get close to Jesus and I go into the church, it's all that serious love stuff, but the fun is all outside in the world. Not true. So in trying to put together today's message, I started to study the Bible and I started to look for all the passages with naked people in them. <laughs> and I thought, what a great place to start. <laughs> I think I've got about four passages for you with naked people in them. I was surprised at how many I found, as a matter of fact. Um, Genesis chapter two, let's go right there. Genesis chapter 2, and this is a picture of love that doesn't die the way we were originally designed. Genesis chapter 2 says that the Lord made woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man, and the man said, now this is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is when the world is perfect and sin has not yet come in. And the man said... This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked. Did I mention naked yet? <laughs> they were both naked and they felt no shame. What's interesting is some of us associate sexuality with a loss of innocence Sexuality does not lead to a loss of innocence. It is sin that leads to a loss of innocence. Amen. So much of what we've seen and heard and experienced has been unhealthy, not the way that God intended. So it's important for you to face this scripture here, the original design. It's beautiful. It's, it's important that, that God... Um, celebrates that and makes that front and center for us. Now, scholars tell us that this, this spot that you're reading here, this is Hebrew poetry. And so this Hebrew poetry that you're reading, the, the reason that I've highlighted that center section there is because this is actually, many scholars think it's a song. So you've got two naked people and the husband calls out in a rapturous song of love to his wife. And I love the Bible. Amen. Amen. 
So some of you know the, the rest of the story. They, they sinned after that. And they ate the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. And when they ate the fruit and they rebelled against God, and I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that you could talk about with that. What, what they did is they, they introduced selfishness, self-centeredness, and self-reliance into the creation. The Bible calls it the curse. Is they brought this uh, massive darkness into the creation and into human relationships. Poison. It's like poison seeped into the creation and into them when they made the choice that they made. The Bible calls it the curse. And I'm going to read some of the verses from the curse to you so that you can see it. First off, Genesis 3.16 says, To the woman God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So two big things that God describes as cursed here is first off, the beauty of motherhood. The joy of motherhood. What it's supposed to be. What it was designed to be. God says it will no longer be that. It will be, it will have an element of pain and brokenness to it. And some of you have experienced motherhood and you're like, I thought it was going to be so perfect and so beautiful. And I didn't realize it could be so broken. And why is it so broken? And the answer according to scripture is it was not originally designed that way. It was designed perfect. And you're getting the broken version. We all are. And then he comes into marriage and he's like, and then there's going to be this weird power dynamic now in your marriage where you're really going to want to be in charge as the woman and he's really going to want to be in charge as the man. And both of you guys are going to be fighting for control and all this power dynamic stuff is going to make things really miserable. Anybody ever experienced that? Well, yeah, a little bit of head nodding going on. So here's the next one, Genesis 3. 317. Then God speaks to the man, cursed is the ground because of you. Now, when he says cursed is the ground, that's, that's the moment where God is saying all creation is now cursed and poisoned. So this is, this is the weather. This is DNA. This is famines and tornadoes. This is hurricanes. This is birth defects. This is mental health struggles. This is physical diseases. This is everything is coming into the creation and being polluted right here. Through painful toil, Adam, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And it will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. This is God <laughs> cursing careers and work. Until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken for dust you are, and to dust you will return. God says all things will die. So to sum up this happy part of the story, this is what cursed marriage looks like. Kids will pull mom and dad apart. There will be power dynamic struggles about who's in charge, who's got the steering wheel of the next financial decision, how we raise the kids, how we discipline, where, what school they will go to. It will pull us apart. And then career challenges and overtime will pull us apart. And ultimately, love will die just like our physical bodies die. No one ever told you love would die, but it does. It fades and it dies. Why? Not because that's the way it was originally designed. We're in the broken part. And that's where the naked people put on clothes again, which is sad to me. <laughs> jokes, just jokes, just jokes. Okay. <laughs> Next, Song of Solomon. Let's go to Song of Solomon 1, 2. She says, kiss me and kiss me again for your love is sweeter than wine. And that word love there is, it's called dode in, in the Hebrew. See, in Hebrew and Greek is kind of this way too. I think Greek's got four words for love. Hebrew's got three or four words for love. Dode here, it's like there's friendship love, right? And there's romantic love and, and there's agape, selfless love. There's all kinds of loves. This one is that sexual love. Dode is to arouse, to caress, to fondle. So you're reading along in the Bible and he just says, love. Well, which one is it? Right? Because I love the bears. I love Doritos and I love my wife. Which love are we talking about? It's important to know. 
This one is dode. And very often throughout the book of Song of Solomon, it is that way. Now, I need to read a little bit of Song of Solomon to you. And it's important to make you blush at this just a little bit because you need to know what's in your Bibles. And some of you are going to be shocked that it's there. Because God had a plan. And he cares about the flutter in your stomach. Song of Songs. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you this. Origin, early church father. Do we have that one? He wrote a Song of Songs commentary in 240 AD, and he said this about it. He said, I advise and counsel everyone who has not ceased to feel the passion of his bodily nature to refrain completely from reading this little book. He's like, if you're not so old that you don't really feel anything anymore, you shouldn't read Song of Solomon because it's going to get you feeling stuff. It's, it's very graphic. It's very intense. There's, there's a lot of moments, I will just tell you, where the, the, um, the translators from the original languages really toned down because they were a little bit too timid. What's going on in some of the scenes in Song of Solomon? This is a great date night reading for sure. Song of Songs 7, 6, I'll give you a little more taste. Oh, how beautiful you are, how pleasing, my love, how full of delights. You are slender like a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like grape clusters and the fragrance of your breath like apples. May your kisses be as exciting as the best wine that's in your Bible, I promise you. You can see why some, uh, right? <laughs> you can see why some people across the ages were uncomfortable letting people read that. Okay, now why are we looking at that today? It is not to show you what kind of an edgy pastor I am. It is not to show you how edgy the Bible is. It's to remind you, show you, and maybe you've never seen it before. Maybe you've never been told this before. That all of love was God's idea. That all of love is what he had for you. And no matter if people have told you to grow up and mature, and why don't you just get with this whole more serious side of love? Let's just do the agape piece. It's like, no. Agape is good, by the way. We talked about that, that on week one. It's great in your marriage to have the golden handcuffs and say, hey, baby, I'm stuck with you. Amen? Yeah. That's good. And that helps and that leads to all kinds of good things. If you haven't heard that one, you need to go back to that one. But today's about the fact that it's not just agape that God wants for you. He wants all of it. Romantic love is a gift from him. Next, this one's really going to challenge you. Proverbs 5, 18. May your fountain be blessed. And may re you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated, shaga, with her love. Literally means to be drunk with love. You ought to be drunk with love. That's your Bible saying that. Now, there's a couple of really important things that I want you to see out of this. Number one is that, that romantic love in this verse and sexual love are kind of intermingled. It talks about the romance that you need to feel and should feel, do feel. And romantic love is different from sexual love, yes? It can be. I mean, and there, there's, there's many times you're, you're having a romantic conversation. You're saying romantic words to each other. You're spending romantic time, often cuddling, quality time. Non-sexual touch, there is such a thing, gentlemen. Non-sexual touch. And all that is good. And it does not necessarily have to lead to sexual contact, but it often in the completion and consummation does. So these are together in this verse. They don't have to be together, but they're brought together here. The other thing I really want you to see is that this is a call to lifelong romantic love. Can we have that verse back up again real quick? Notice that it says, may your fountain be blessed, may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. So who's it talking to? An old man. This verse is written to an old guy who's still married. It says, don't go look in someplace else. How about you focus on the lady that you married? 
And maybe your retort, old guy, would be, yeah, but some of the fire has died. Time to relight it. (laughs) Time to relight it. And the expectation of Scripture is that you would experience romantic and sexual love across the entirety of your relationship. And so if the fire has gone out, it is absolutely required that we relight it. Amen? Yes. Next, why doesn't it last? What actually gets in there and ruins our love or makes the fire go out? Let's, let's dive into that just a little bit. Song of Songs 215. It says, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love. For the grape vines are blossoming. So back to poetry again. Let me just explain it to you. So, so they're, they're looking at their relationship and they're saying, our relationship is really good. It's really healthy. There's a lot of fruit here. But in this really healthy vineyard, there are these outside forces that are coming in. We're just going to call them foxes for now that want to come in and destroy what we've built. This good thing that we've got going. They're like, somebody needs to catch those foxes. Now, back up from that for a second. What the heck are they talking about foxes? What are the foxes? It's not in the next verse. They leave it vague, which I love when the Bible does that. It just says, hey, no matter who you are today, there are some things that are coming from the outside trying to ruin your relationship. And what are they? Well, they might change from generation to generation. That might be why God left that spot blank so that we could fill it with our own list of foxes. So I'm going to give you a list of foxes. We're going to get really practical. But here's what you need to do. And you might want to write it down on a piece of paper or on your phone. But I want you to think very, very carefully, what are your top three foxes in your relationship? What are the top three things that have come against your relationship to bring harm to your love? Because it doesn't matter what all the things are. What matters is your marriage. So ask yourself that as we go through this. Number one, money issues. We've all heard the statistics, right? Like how um, damaging money can be and Uh, arguments and disagreements on money, uh, on a relationship, how it can lead to divorce, debt, fighting, selfishness, all of it. Next is chores. This is always the surprising one. People are like, chores really grow up? No, 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 no. (laughs) Come on. I don't care how old you are. You did the dishes more than they did this week. Come on. Like, like when it comes to chores, like we fight more about what's fair in the realm of chores than almost anything else. And some of you guys are so great about like we sat down and we've divvied out the chores and he's got his list and she's got her list and it's all great. Yeah, until it's not so great. <laughs> right? So chores can definitely be an issue. Sexual frustration is you've got different libidos and different sexual appetites. And it's not necessarily what you might expect for the guy or for the lady. We've been, my wife and I have been talking with couples for a long time. The, the, the thing is, they're different. And how do you serve each other, understand each other, love each other through those difficulties? Next is exhaustion. You go through seasons of life. Newborn kids, anybody? Anybody? And it can be hard to keep love alive when so much focus and attention is going on to the kids. And when you're losing so much sleep because of the kids. And when the emotional issues of the kids are such a big deal in the house that you can't give emotional energy to each other. We get exhausted. Even even different things like, like I'm going for that extra degree or I'm trying to get the next promotion and I'm working all this overtime for it. That impacts your marriage. Is that one of the foxes for you? In-laws, need I say more? <laughs> in-laws, in-laws, in-laws are wonderful. I mean that, I do. <laughs> I mean that can be a wonderful blessing. But when we struggle with who's got our loyalty, our spouse or the in-laws. That's when it gets painful. Figure loyalty out. 
It is for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Back to Genesis. You got to leave before you can cleave. Next, loss of romance. The shock of losing love can sink you. Some of you did just never expected love to fade. And when it did, you were so shocked and so discouraged by it, you thought you had done something massively wrong or chosen the wrong person. And that itself can be a fox. Next, hurts and arguments, the things we say, the lines that we cross. We went over this last week. On forgiveness, keeping a list about all the things that they've done to you. We all do it. But 1 Corinthians says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Amen. One of the hardest verses to obey in a marriage. So, so difficult. Next is emotional distance. This is, this is when other hurts have piled up and you start just stepping back from each other. Maybe not physically, but you're just not emotionally in each other's lives anymore. You're just not interested anymore. You're not processing through the day anymore. You're not respecting each other anymore. That, that, that word honor, you kind of stop doing that. Emotional distance, health problems, things like sickness, physical and mental health issues can come into the marriage and make it very difficult to keep love alive. And then the big issues like abuse, unfaithfulness, and bitterness. So do you have your top three? Face them. It's, it is, it's, it's more important than anything I say is that you know what yours are. Because what I'm hoping is, especially for you guys that are here today and you're here today as couples, I hope that you're holding hands right now. And I hope that you're squeezing sometimes. Like That's what we got to work on. Like we've got to try this again. It's worth trying this again. I choose you all over again. Let's try this again. So hold on to that. Solutions are coming. Um, first, just a tiny bit more bad news. This is how the world looks and, and expects marriages to be. And you all know this, but it's just going to say it in a concise way. The world wants love that won't die. So you've got to, here's the formula. You've got to find the right person. You've got to fall in love with them. You've got to fix all of your hopes and dreams and expectations on them like they're a mini God in your life. Totally unfair, but it's what we all do. And then when they fail at meeting all your expectations, you eventually give up and start again. And this is kind of how the relationships go out in the world. And when you go and you start again, what, what, what you're doing is you're saying, what, I must not have found my soulmate, so I'm going to go look for another person. And the problem is that you're taking yourself with you. <laughs> Some of you got that. Okay. Okay, but here's, here's the real problem with it is that in the midst of all of that, what is the world doing? The world is assuming that love shouldn't die. If love was right, it shouldn't die, and it does. And the Christian story is very, very different, and hopefully you've seen it in Scripture all the way up until this point because it's massive for you is love does die. The fire does go out. And it doesn't mean you chose the wrong person or that you need to try again with a new relationship. What it means is that you need to relight the fire. Christianity expects death. That's why we have resurrection. Yes? yes. Quit being so intimidated by death. In any of your life and in any of your relationships, quit being shocked by it. God, let's bring new life to this thing. Let's go. How do we get started? Um, when I was a kid, we went on vacation with my grandparents. And I've got a picture of my grandparents right there. The kid in the super fancy striped uh, pants is me. Back when I had blonde hair, long, long time ago. But the important point in that picture is that you see the two people in the center who are George and Betty Zimmerman. I called them Nana and Papa, my grandparents. And when my dad left our home when I was really young, Grandma and Grandpa 
ran right into the center of things and helped raise us, helped fix everything that was wrong, and we kind of did everything together, and they helped life work for a single mom of three kids. Amazing people. Grandpa was head of the, the elder board at the church, wonderful Christian man, World War II veteran, owned his own catering business. He was a union leader where he worked at the, at the uh, foundry that he worked at. He started a credit union. I mean, just amazing, amazing guy, community leader, business leader, spiritual leader, and I just respected him so much he could do no wrong. And then grandma was just the sweetest lady ever and so quiet and so classy and amazing lady, Betty. So we go on vacation one time. We're down South Carolina and we go as a family. And again, grandpa's always in the middle of everything. And we go on this vacation to South Carolina and all of a sudden there's like two or three days and they disappear. And it's just us. And it was so odd. And I remember asking my mom at the time, where did Nana and Papa go? And she said, well, this campground that we stayed at, one of the things that they had available was a little marriage conference. And I'm like, well, why would they go to a marriage conference? Assuming they're perfect. She says, their love isn't what it used to be. And I don't know if grandma twisted his arm or the other way around, but somebody twisted an arm. And we went to the marriage conference and there was impact to the marriage because they went to the marriage conference. Now, if you know anybody from that generation, the greatest generation, they weren't so great at admitting their faults. They weren't so great at admitting when they needed stuff. Like, we can talk about mental health and counselors all day long in this generation. But for them, that was massive to admit that you needed something. But here's what's beautiful about it, is I got to see resurrection take place in a marriage even as a kid, and I had no words for it, didn't even know what I was looking at, but now I do. Here's the thing, guys. Like, all across this room, we talked about this in prayer before first service. All across this room, there are marriages here right now and online where you guys have lost love. It's faded for you. And then you found out how to resurrect it. And you're more in love today than you were before the problems started. And some of you guys, you've experienced that little resurrection two or three or four times. Because once you've learned the secret of resurrection to your love, you just keep doing it. And I'm so blessed because I've got the story of my grandparents that inspired me. Because Linda and I have gone through it too, multiple times. And we've probably got more ahead. And we need to not get so intimidated by death because our God is a resurrecting God. And I'm glad that I got to know about that. And and, and some of you guys might even think to yourself, it's like, if these stories are all around our church, then why don't we hear them more often? Because man, that would inspire us. It would give us some hope, yes? Here's why we don't hear about them very often. Because when love faded, we're shocked by it. When love faded, we think that we did something wrong and there's shame associated with that. And so we don't like to tell people those stories. And I'm just calling you guys out. You need to tell those stories. And at minimum, you need to tell your kids, hey, when you get married, this is going to happen. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite authors, said this, Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God that knew the way out of the grave. He knows the way out of the grave. Like that's, that's the source of our hope. Is that he gets it. It's not this worldly expectation that it shouldn't die. Oh no, it will. But he knows the way out of the grave. And do you see your loving father who designed this creation? Like he had to let you know that that's how he worked. So he came into every single night when it's so cold and black outside and he gave you a dawn that devours it. And he comes into every winter. Wasn't it cold outside when you came here this morning? God comes into every winter and he swallows it up with spring. 
And so he wove resurrection and allowed death in every single aspect of creation. God did. To help us understand that that's our way out. Don't be intimidated by death. It's okay if your love has died today because God knows the way out of the grave. Are we serious now? Right? Like, Like this is part marriage conference right now. Like, you know what your three foxes are. You know what's going on in your relationship. I don't want this message to go in one ear and out the other and you go off to lunch. I want you to make a decision today that you're going to seek God for resurrection. And that's important. So how do you resurrect love? How do you fall in love all over again? Let's go to, um, this is, Revelation chapter two, verse four. Jesus says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. Now, some of you Bible scholars in the room, you know that this passage of scripture I just read to you, this is from a conversation that Jesus is having with a church in the book of Revelation. And so he's coming to that church and he's saying, when you guys first became a church, you guys weren't so focused on all the business and the processes and the ministries and the butts and seats and all that kind of stuff. You were actually in love with God. He says, I want you to get back to that. Remember when you used to be in love with God? He says, as a church, that's what should define you. So go back to your first love because God cares about romance. He cares about how it feels. This principle that he gives you for resurrection in this verse, this is not just for reviving a church. This is also for reviving your broken relationship with your kids. This is the same for you reviving your broken marriage. It's all right here. So what do I do? Here's four steps, four R's for you. How to fall in love again. For real, he wrote it in the Bible. Number one, is you've got to remember. He says, you need to remember from how, fall, how high you have fallen. You got to remember how good it was. Jesus is saying, go back in the photo albums and look at how much you were smiling back then. Pull up the old wedding video and look at how happy those two kids were. You need to remember how high you were and how low you are now. Why? Because step one, remember, it's going to inspire you. Don't settle. Don't settle for fading love. Next, repent. Decide today that it's worth it. Decide today that you're not going to stay where you are, that you're not going to let it continue to fade. Decide today. Squeeze their hand a little bit. I'm deciding today. Because we can just coast, yes? We can just keep going the way that it's always been. And that hasn't been working for us. I love that word, repent, in the Bible. It means don't just have warm feelings in the direction of God. Actually turn and go toward God. Make a decision. It's the most important thing on that list. Next is the practical. Repeat. Repeat the things that you used to do. This is the practical step. All the things that you used to do, just go back and make a list of all the stuff that made her fall in love with you. And do those things again. Because you forgot. Life got busy and things took over and you stopped doing those things. Why does that list matter? Because that's the list that worked on her. The dates, the flowers, the gifts. You used to write handwritten notes to her. You used to be so crazy about each other, you couldn't keep your hands off of each other. Yes? Quality time. No one had to tell you to spend quality time. You just did it. You might have to schedule it now. So schedule it. Do all the things that you used to do and see what happens. See how practical Jesus is here? Just do the stuff. Number four, reach. Reach for God's help. Because you can't recreate romantic love in a human heart. Only he can. 
So you're going to go do all the stuff and you're going to repent and you're going to remember and all that kind of wonderful stuff. But at the end of the day, you need to beg God for a fire to be relit in your hearts. When Linda and I have gone through this, I remember an elder named Steve told me to do this. I said, what do I do about the fact that we fell out of love? And he said, pray. Ask God to give it back to you. <coughs> Felt so weird. I'm like, you can't pray about love. Yes, you can. And God did. And God heard me. And he restored it. Amen? Amen. Why don't you guys stand? We have a God who knows his way out of the grave. Oh, let's pray. Jesus, so many relationships in here in this room and online, God, I pray, Lord, that you would see them. <clears throat> Doesn't matter what anybody else in the row is doing. It matters what, what they do right now and whether or not they offer their hearts up to you for real right now, God. Lord, come and speak. Lord, I pray that you would come and where we've tried before, Lord, I pray that you would make our steps real before us, God, and that you would light a fire in our hearts, God, for each other. Jesus, thank you that you care about human love. Thank you, God, that the butterflies in the stomach matter to you, Jesus. God, we see your joy in that. Your joy was right there at Genesis 2, right in the beginning. God, and your joy is here for us now. And God, forgive us for being too serious about stuff. And forgive us for getting intimidated by death because all things fade. So I pray for a spirit of resurrection. In Christ's name, amen.